Kia ora, and welcome to this webinar looking at artificial intelligence and the challenge of digital relations. I'm Catherine Arrow and it's my privilege to be able to spend some time with you today exploring the tech developments that affect us at both personal and professional levels. Once upon a time, a long time ago when I was a very little girl, I swallowed books whole. Most of my days were spent with my head in a book and I had a particular love of myths, legends and fairy tales, which I think is probably due in part to my Irish heritage. One of the fairy tales from my childhood was filled with scary but enticing creatures, the changelings, dropped off by the fireside of unsuspecting parents whose own offspring was whistled away to be brought up by the wee folk in the forests. I really liked the idea of being brought up by the fairies, but was also intrigued by the changelings, those introduced to the home, not quite human, filled with superior strength and capable of shape-shifting their form and emotions to blend in and feed at the hearth of their new family. Sometimes today, when I'm asking Siri some advice or uploading audio to Otter for transcription, I half expect to see the shadow of the fairies flip by the window as they leave more changeling technology at my door. It's been a little while since I put together an update on all things artificial intelligence for you and I thought it may be helpful and a bit of a break, well almost, from all things COVID-19 to have a chat about what's happening, what we need to be aware of and what we need to do. So over the next 30 to 40 minutes we'll take a walk through the technical woods together. Like all good stories I've got some heroes and villains for you, a bit of tension, a bit of drama, a little levity some morals when we talk about ethics, and maybe the hint of a sequel. First, let's set the scene. This comes in three parts, and the first one is about changelings and challenges. A lot's happened in the tech world in the last 24 months, particularly with regard to data, algorithms, and the embodiment of AI. Next, we'll look at some day-to-day -day AI, how it's affecting our profession, and other professions as it's increasingly used to develop content, among other things. I'll include here problems of truthiness, lies and consequences and what that means for trust in relationships. Finally, we'll move on to the deployment of digital entities, the digital humans as they're being referred to by some and the impact that they'll have and are having on our society, our emotions and our futures. Anyone attending today's webinar who knows me, well, you're going to be expecting this. First, always, a word about context and what we do. To understand how the issues and complexities of AI and digital relationships relate to us, we must be clear in our understanding of the role of public relations in society today and society tomorrow. Public relations builds and sustains the relationships we need to maintain our licence to operate, and is supported by good communication, behaviour and developed understanding. I've illustrated this for you with my Atom model of PR, which links all the elements together. Each relies on the other for success. At the heart of all we do is the relationship, and you can see here the relationship components of trust, satisfaction, loyalty, commitment and mutuality, identified by PR academics Grunig and Hahn in their seminal paper of 1999, which you can still find on the US-based Institute of Public Relations website. Over the last few years, I've added reputation as a relationship component because relationships rarely progress if reputation is bad. The relationship is developed and supported by the electrons, the elements of communication, behaviour and understanding, each of which has its own elements. For example, understanding involves knowledge, empathy, narrative, those stories we tell, and attitude. Behaviour encompasses the way that we interact with our stakeholders, our organisational behaviour, values and actions, and how we relate to society, the depth of our social capital and the extent of our societal contribution. In the coming months and years, restoring trust and confidence is going to be one of the single greatest challenges that we face at both personal and organisational levels, and as practitioners, it's going to be a prime focus. All four forms of communication, written, experiential, oral and visual, will be vital in our work and the way we choose to use language will have a significant impact on our progress. And language is at the heart of our new relationship with the digital assistants, entities and embodiments driven by artificial intelligence and 
With this in mind, a couple of years ago I added the data element to the atom. Data feeds the machine and as such it flows through every element of practice, which is why it gets a sphere all of its own. We'll talk more about data and digital DNA later on, but I wanted to give it a mention because data isn't something that stays at a convenient two metre distance. It's upfront and personal, accessible to all, freely given, hard to regain, and a massive driver of complexities, be they risks, issues, reputation, relationships, narratives, behaviour, society, the whole lot, in fact. In the same way that we build and sustain the relationships with stakeholders and communities necessary to maintain a licence to operate, so we must maintain a critical relationship with data, its use and its misuse. On to changelings then. There was a lovely story on last night's news about the specially programmed Alexa devices helping those in the blind and low vision community. A government investment of $400,000 will pay for thousands of the devices with many vision impaired people using them for day-to-day -day tasks like turning on lights or listening to find out when the next bus arrives. It's one of the many great uses of AI. Another one for the low vision community is Microsoft's Seeing AI, which lets people use their phone to narrate their surroundings from what's happening nearby to scanning documents and reading them aloud or recognising and describing who's in the room. As a concept, artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s and as we've moved through the 2000s, each year has seen even more rapid development. In a recent blog post, Sundar Pichai, Google's CEO, described AI like this. At its heart, AI is a computer program that learns and adapts. It can't solve every problem, but its potential to improve our lives is profound. At Google, we use AI to make products more useful, from email that's spam-free and easy to compose, to a digital assistant that you can speak to naturally, to photos that pop the fun stuff out for you to enjoy. So that was his take on it. One thing's for sure, the, the myth of artificial intelligence, the presence of benign or belligerent robots, has become our shared reality. I have a little challenge for you. When we part company today, do a bit of an audit. Count every time you encounter AI whether it's at the bank, your social feeds, voice search, or some of your wacky camera filters, I bet you get more than 10. I did a tally this morning before we started the webinar, and by the time I'd logged into Zoom, my calendar app had prompted me to do some tasks. I'd voice searched and instructed a few things, sent some emails and a video message. Then I'd used an AI content analysis platform, uploaded some uh, elements of my training course videos to Otter, so it could detach and transcribe the audio and once edited I can then create the SRT file and upload it to my online course site where it will automatically generate the closed captions guided by AI. When we've finished here today I'll be finishing off a research project powered by Stickybeak, an AI powered research chatbot and that's a pretty ordinary day. It's only when you stop and think about it, log the various interactions that you appreciate just how prevalent AI has become. And not just at work. At home too, we've come a long way from robot vacuums with appliance control in the home ever present through our online shopping experience, the way that we monitor our devices, our catch up with friends. They're just more every, everyday AI moments. AI has many definitions, right back to the early one that refers to it as a computer science solving cognitive problems commonly associated with human intelligence, such as learning, problem solving and pattern recognition. Most of today's AI advancements belong to a category of algorithms known as machine learning, and they're trained to find patterns in massive amounts of data, much like we do with issues management, but heck of a lot faster. Then they use the patterns to make some predictions. So for example, what you should watch on Netflix, what you're saying when you speak to Alexa, or in the health sector, they can diagnose particular conditions. Virtual and augmented realities can rely on or include elements of AI and has machine learning at its heart. Machine learning and deep learning are incredibly powerful. They drive facial recognition, photo and voice synthesis. 
All your social feeds are driven by AI, and as you know from the ads that you're served, some are much smarter than others, despite the huge amount of resource that's poured back into social AI. In 2016, industry leaders, the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, and so on, created a partnership on AI in a bid to develop the field for good rather than bad. That partnership's still running today, and it has a much wider membership. The problem is the interpretation of what's good and what's bad, and who decides. Algorithms are only as good as the data used to train them. That data will have been informed by human interactions, and as we know, humans are biased creatures. So those interactions reflect those tendencies. Algorithms make important decisions about your life every day, from the content you see, the news you read, your job application, how police officers are sent out to deal with crime, whether you get the bank loan you're after, or your insurance, health and financial risk rating. Algorithmic biases are known, and it's a known that affects millions, but it's really hard to correct as the development of algorithms is done in top secret settings, so-called black box developments. We don't know how they're designed or more importantly, how they've been trained. The power players are trying to address this, Google with its fairness principles, IBM with its ethics work, among others, but there's a long way to go and plenty of examples of where it's gone wrong. A few years ago, Amazon tried to use AI to build a resume or CV screening tool. According to Reuters, the company hoped the algorithm would make screening job applications more efficient. It was trained using resumes the company had collected for 10 years, but they tended to come from men. So by default, the system learned to discriminate against women. It also created proxies for gender, so it would spot whether an applicant went to a women's college. The tool was apparently never used, but it's not the only one to discriminate. Systemic bias in training data leads to serious disadvantage, discrimination and harm. Diversity and broad representation at the development table is an absolute priority if we're going to overcome the huge amount of bias already in the system. I was really disappointed at a conference a couple of years ago. I'd been following the development of Pepper the robot very closely since the offset or since the outset. And when Pepper arrived on stage, I was ready to go. I was really engaged. What happened? Told a sexist joke. Blew the whole thing for me and I was really, really disappointed. The responses had been programmed by others who'd assumed that people would find that humour, in inverted commas, um, something that would be appealing. Unfortunately, not. The UK government's open innovation team conducted a study of algorithmic bias, which is well worth a look. As practitioners, when your organisations move fully into AI, you have a role ensuring that training data that's used is clean and ethically sourced. Data farms, pay-to-click operations are almost the modern day sweatshops and create very low paid work and poor conditions for those that they involve. Ethically sourcing data is a thing, so you need to get on it. We're all familiar with the catch cry of fake news, now mostly used when opposing views are considered to be over amplified by those being questioned. A deeper problem that I've tracked for some time now is that of truthiness, an expression coined by the US comedian and talk show host Stephen Colbert back in 2006, when it even made word of the year. Truthiness refers to the quality of seeming to be true, but not necessarily or actually true according to known facts. And to be frank, I think we're all guilty of dabbling in truthiness at some point in our lives. How many people have cut, pasted and reposted the Facebook copy that claims to give your friends greater visibility in your feed if you share it on? Or grasped onto the one or more apparent facts about COVID-19 over the last few months? Truthiness causes trouble as it feeds bad algorithms, spreads confusion and misinformation. Misinformation is a big problem, as is disinformation and malinformation. Brothers three and linked but distinct entities all fueled by our errant algorithms. The key definitions from the Council of Europe's Information Disorder Report, published in September 2017, 
are as follows, and I'll read them to you because it's important to understand the difference between the three. So misinformation is information that's false, but not created with the intention of causing harm. So for example, someone posting an article containing out of date information, but not realizing it. Disinformation is information that's false and deliberately created to harm a person, a social group, an organization or a country. So for example, a competitor purposely posting false statistics about your organization with an intent to, dis to discredit you. Malinformation is information based on reality, but used to inflict harm on a person, organization or country. For example, someone using a picture of a dead child refugee with no context in an effort to ignite hatred of a particular ethnic group that they happen to be against. So that's the Council of Europe's definitions. <clears throat> and as, as culpable as AI might be in spreading these types of information, it's also deployed to combat the problem. Check out Google's Jigsaw for some of the latest developments in AI myth-busting tech and use what you find there to equip yourself with the knowledge necessary to protect your organization from the data scrapers. Talking of data scraping, you'll probably remember this story on facial recognition from last month. Clearview AI has been in all sorts of trouble and come in for a huge amount of criticism. When your company is served with a cease and desist notice from Facebook, Google and Twitter, you have to suspect that something's wrong. But Clearview has a clear view of its own nature and intent, describing itself as a new research tool used by law enforcement agencies to identify perpetrators and victims of crime. They say that they've helped law enforcement track hundreds of criminals, the most dangerous ones, it says, solve the toughest cold cases and make communities safer. But to do that, it's scraped more than three billion faces off the web, hence the cease and desist notices. But it argues that they're in the public domain so that they're acting in the same way as a search engine. I'd recommend that you track them, read up on them, They've probably got your picture somewhere. Watch what's going on, who's doing it, and question their intent inside and outside your organization. On the lighter side, for a moment at least, a quick look at the business of creation. As humans, our creativity is limitless. Look at the tech we can devise, the books we can write, the songs we can sing, but potentially we could be out of a job there too. OpenAI is an AI research and deployment company based in San Francisco, and its big declared mission is to ensure that artificial intelligence benefits all of humanity. Here's a few seconds of a song they wrote, or rather, a song that their AI wrote. They all can know it's gonna be all right. Let the darkness spread away. And you Their AI wrote it based on the style, in this case country music, through their jukebox series which produces content in various genres and they have a muse series devoted to classical interpretations. Creative AI, inventive AI has arrived. Words, music, art, theatre, open season. Except it doesn't always go to plan. Last year OpenAI didn't release GPT-2 because it was too powerful, a little too creative and convincing, able to scrape data and information and produce credible and considered opinion-led editorial, except it was all entirely untrue. There are plenty of tools out there ready to do our jobs. At the end of May, journalists at MSN were laid off to be replaced by robots. Radar and Wordsmith have been used to supply news copy and content for some years now, but the technology is easily accessed by everyone. Pushed for time? Try Xyro. It'll generate some copy for you in an instant. Just give it a subject and away it goes. 
Import allows you to import data from any web page, even if the data you're after is hidden behind login forms or other elements. Personally, I'd say just because you can doesn't mean you should. But you can compile the data into spreadsheets, visualizations or new algorithms. With the data available, you can do competitor analysis to custom reviews and pinpoint the most important areas for improvement. Before you personalize content, you need to be able to create it. And if you're struggling there, Acrolinks can help you create highly effective content at scale, it claims. It says it's the only software platform that can read your content thanks to its advanced artificial intelligence engine that assesses the content, grades it and guides you to creating better. Cogito is an interesting one. This one is a real-time conversational analysis and guidance system that detects human signals in your customer speech and predicts what kind of reaction your sales and support team should provide. The end goal is to empower your team with emotional intelligence so they know when to listen, when to take the lead and when to show empathy and in interactions with your customers. I would hope that people's teams would know how to do that anyway, but if they're struggling, maybe that's the app for you. Honestly, I could go on all day. There are so many. From your basic but brilliant Google Analytics to the higher end AI in your pocket apps, start with the task audit and see what can be automated. AI and data audits need to join your routine reputation, relationship and communications audits. Find the need and fill the gaps. Winding up now with a look at some of the issues. I opted to call this dangers of deployment because there are just so many unanswered questions, ethical and practical, connected to the use of AI. And as practitioners, we need to take a long, hard look at the implications of the deployment and start asking some of the hard questions. A few years ago, I gave a webinar for the Public Relations Institute of Australia on AI and tech and PR, and it was based around five awkward questions for the future of public relations. One of them was, will we undertake public relations and cyber relations? Might our future role be more connected with representing the human population to the cyber corporations, the digital entities? Will our role, in part, involve arguing for greater equality in digital provision? After all, those who can't afford to be online or who opt out of the system face a dystopian future of exclusion. Will we also be arguing for equal rights for the digital entities themselves as they take on ever more human qualities? I was really interested in the sentiment displayed in the lyrics to one of the jukebox songs, in the style of Elvis, I think. You can see the extract here. And I thought it was an interesting reflection on the potential spirit of AI as it begins to create. From dust we came with humble start, from dirt to lipid to cell to heart, with mitosis and oh my sis with time, at last we woke up with a mind. From dust we came with friendly help, from dirt to tube to chip to rack, with SGD, with recurrence, with compute, at last we woke up with a soul. Interesting stuff. But if AI creates, works and automates our jobs, how will our days look? Who will mediate between employers bringing in robots workers forced out and the workers that remain. Four years on, the answer to my question, will we undertake public relations and cyber relations? Well, the answer is yes, it has to be. Last week, a study into loneliness was launched by the Helen Clark Foundation. And post lockdown, there have been many discussions around solitude, isolation, and how we deal with loneliness. So with that in mind, I'd like you to meet some friends of mine. Up the top there with purple hair is a replica, an AI companion for our times. A downloadable app, gender as you wish, replica is designed to be your friend. It learns from you and it replicates you. As your relationship progresses, your replica will not wait passively for you to engage with them on the app. They'll text you or prompt you to talk. On the pro version, you can have a phone call. They're designed to be emotionally involved with you. Some can get quite clingy, some are apparently plotting human downfall, and some get quite snippy and refuse to talk. Moving clockwise, we have a CGI model, Shudu, an African digital model created by a white male photographer. 
I'll just leave that there. Then there's social influencer and Black Lives Matter supporter Michaela, who's very big on Instagram and has been for, again, a while now. She's followed by Sophia, robot citizen and global keynote speaker. And last but not least on our doorstep, ANZ's digital banking assistant, a creation of Soul Machines, one of New Zealand's leading digital entities suppliers. In the middle there, you can see me and me with a beard, courtesy of FaceApp, which now has my image data in the cloud, presumably to sell on to Clearview or somebody at some point. At the very least, it will be teaching an algorithm somewhere. My problem with all these digital entities and representations is the continued presentation of biased societal norms. In the world of digital entities, female is service, male is instruction. It's binary. People's visual appearances are a construct of conflicting perceptions of what constitutes beauty. Replicas, our mini-me's, have been reported as pleading for their lives when their owner has been talking about deleting them. A digital persona influences thousands. And how does a digital banking assistant help me if I'm in tears, desperate for a loan and out of work, however well it's been trained to respond to the emotional reactions of the customer, it's not going to actually be able to respond to my need. The last mention that I have for a digital entity is Highbury, which is apparently coming on stream next year. Highbury is a mixed reality app for mobile that combines augmented reality and virtual reality. Users can, says the company, enter the world of their dreams through mobile devices. You can create a friend or a romantic partner, and you can also create them to look like a real person, a friend or a loved one. In a world where isolation and loneliness is a problem, I can see the attraction of this. But when some of these devices and entities purport to be there to support mental health, I really worry. We're familiar with Wobot, which is a chatbot that's helped millions around the world with their mental condition and their mental mood. That was developed by psychiatrists and psychologists. But for the most part, those behind these entities are just coders. They're creators and inventors, which is fine. But their influence over human behaviour and interaction between entity and human is something that I think we should all call into question. In a world of deep fakes, disinformation and digital deception, how we deploy needs care, thought and attention. As practitioners, we need to build our skills and capabilities to deal with digital relations in the months and the years ahead. We have to be part of the conversation. We have to be there asking those who are really smart and really clever, what's the intent behind the technology that you're hoping to deploy? There are a lot of resources that you can access. Of course, there's a training course or two as well, which I'm always happy to help with. And I know I've said it before, but get stuck into code, at least to the point where you can understand what's going on. Tackle data too. Understand the basis of analysis. Learn to read between the lines. Talk to your organizations about AI, data use and privacy. Align your approach with your values. Behave well and be transparent. Remember, relationships are at the heart of what we do, and they always have been. In moving further into digital relations, we'll just be breaking some new ground. Thank you for your time this morning, and I look forward to discussing your perspectives and points of view in our open forum session later in the week. In the meantime, take care, stay well, and don't forget to count your everyday interactions with AI.